thanks, Sharon, uh, for the introduction. And thanks, you all, especially Sharon and Dan, for having me here at this conference, but also having me for the entire academic year. I look forward to being able to focus on research. Uh, and we'll be happy to speak to any one of you in the coming year. So you already know from Sharon's introduction who I am and what I'm basically about. Um, so in this presentation, I will focus on more contemporary issues. I will focus largely on Sweden in an international context, though, while discussing contemporary issues related to gender equality, uh, more specifically, gender, parenthood, and time allocation. And I will piggyback some, uh, uh, on, somewhat on Oriel's pre previous presentation. So we all know, to set the scene, that Sweden is one of the most gender equal countries in the world, often depicted as a progressive paradise, not less compared to the United States, where both men and women can have it all, implying a high degree of work, family compatibility. And yes, Sweden um, became a precursor in gender equality in the late 1960s when female labor force participation um, increased um, to a far larger extent than in other countries. Today, women's labor force participation is very close to men, 93%. The gender wage gap has consistently decreased um, throughout the century and has since the, since the 1990s been around 92% if we look at the most aggregate that you can still yet do certain kinds of full-time, part-time controls and industrial controls for. Um, so um, there has been a rapid, also a rapid shift in women's qualifications, both in absolute terms and relative to men. Today, women make up um, more than 60% of all students in higher education and are increasingly represented in, in, in prestigious uh, profes professional programs leading to prestigious careers. So having said that, I'm not all that a cheerful Pollyanna. I acknowledge that uh, gender inequities still exist in Sweden. Women on average earn less than men, mainly due to segregation in the labor market that is extensive both along horizontal and vertical lines. Women continue to do more unpaid work than men, which leaves us with a situation where women and men in Sweden are more equal than women and men elsewhere, but there is still room for change and um, need for research in understanding why these inequities persist. Um, why do we have the tendency for women to sort into occupations with less of career opportunities, typically in the public sector, and to a large extent adjust their family lives according to these, um, uh, this situation. But in, if we lift our, our view and, and look in a global context, um, as this graphic illustration of the Global Gender Gap Index provides, it is clear that Sweden, together with its Nordic neighbors, are front runners in gender equality and the closing of different gender gaps relating to education, labor market, and politics. This is partly related to the countries being rich countries, being able to afford less gender differences, but also because of a comprehensive welfare state set up that supports gender equality through extensive social infrastructure, not just uh, um, single family policy initiatives, but rather a very comprehensive social infrastructure, um, which makes a big difference. So in broad terms, my talk today is undertaken against the backdrop of long-term trends relating to women's increasing economic activities and labor market status. Notably, labor force participation of women, especially mothers, that has increased steadily since the 1960s. 
making the dual earner household the norm early on in Sweden, just as has been the case in the rest of Europe and North America. So I believe that women's increased involvement in the labor market is one of the most important changes in the economy in the past sector, this century. According to theory, however, the transformation of women's employment should put pressure on the family. We know from theory that there is a negative relationship assumed between female education, work orientation, and fertility. Um, also a negative association between women's economic uh, independence and union stability is assumed. So higher female education and earnings will destabilize unions and families because of lower specialization gains to marriage and less female dependence on the, the spouse, says, for example, Gary Becker, but also sociologists. But contrary to expectations, this is not the case in Sweden today, which I show in this power couple paper from 2010. Higher education does not lead to lower fertility. Couples where both partners are highly educated, professionals are actually more likely to continue childbearing and less likely to separate. Those who actually should be less involved in family building are the most family oriented once they get into a family situation. And this is not that they're highly selective. We have a very general family formation um, <clears throat> rule applying uh, across the population. So the end of family life due to women's economic emancipation that was much feared in the 1960s and 70s is, well, it's not a threat anymore in Sweden, it seems. So one hypothesis that I launch in, in a project is, is that gender equality is actually conducive to family formation, but only when a nation reaches a certain level of gender equality where men's and women's economic roles are comparable, such as being on par 90%. At this level of gender equality, women's education, employment, and earnings are actually similar to men and impose the same uh, effects on family formation. We are in a new equilibrium where we have to rethink theory. So this is distinctly different from what social theorists like Becker and Parson related to while they posited that family structures would, and activities would actually converge towards the male breadwinner family in 1950s gender roles. And clearly, they were very wrong. Despite this, we mainly relate to this body of theory with, um, in our work. Um, even in this project, we take our point of departure in neoclassical e economic theory of time allocation and marriage. Uh, we do acknowledge that there have been extensions and reactions to this paradigm, but, but basically this is what we're thinking about. We're relating to a theory that took its point of departure in a world where work was male dominated with the exception of young single women where women, if married, focused on domestic work uh, and childcare with sudden fists of frustration acknowledged, <laughs> but overall very different from the family and context of dual earner households that we knew, know today. So just to put you in, in a international context, this is where I place Sweden the high labor force participation rate comparable to men, a high employment rate of mothers with children under six in the household, still a rather big chunk of part-time employment um, relating almost to, to 90% of, of uh, care responsibilities for children primarily, um, extensive paid maternity uh, leave and parental leave schemes. Um, a large chunk of fathers who take any parental leave, if only on a total 25% of the total leave scheme, which extends for more than a year. A high <clears throat> degree of childcare enrollment rates, especially among the ones 
over 3, actually the ones over 1. So, um, because you're not entitled to childcare because you're, before your child turns 1. So, it puts Sweden in, in an international context um, that we all know about. So, I'm going to speak basically resting on well uh, known theory. Um, this project that I'm going to talk about um, in more detail relating to a couple of papers rests upon theory that um, talk about optimization problems in determining the most efficient time allocation of each family member uh, given marginal values and this means agreeing on some kind of division of household labor. The quantity of E, and it also has implications for how much free time people will have. We're acknowledging the work by those reacting to neoclassical theory, acknowledging bargaining models and the sociological um, relative resource theories. But more or less, theory is thinking that higher earnings potential will lead people to do more market work and less housework. And to a large extent, theory is gender neutral, even though there are gender reactions to that. To the extent that um, it could actually be that gender permeates the, the existence of men and women so much that time allocation is featuring gender display, such as non-traditional men and women will do gender, displaying gender uh, identity rather than uh, what would be economically optimal for them. Uh, typic typically, the highly educated women who will compensate their brilliant careers by doing lots of housework and childcare while, while low educated men, unemployed men, even resist doing domestic chores. Um, we also have theory that says that specialization gains are towards the minimal in more gender equal contexts, such as um, the work by Valerie Oppenheimer, and that this would lead to gender neutral specialization. And we're also drawing it on, on theory in which the couple situation matters in which equality may enforce more egalitarian uh, views and resemblance in preference and resources may strengthen cooperations in, in couples for a common good, such as family, if you have a family. We also relate to theory where education is important. Education is very important for time allocation because higher education is associated with, with more money, uh, better career opportunities, um, a higher return. So there should be a positive association with paid work and negative with unpaid work and leisure. And then we have the, the discussion about is all Unpaid work, similar. Is domestic work and childcare different? And here we have strong reasons to believe that the, there should rather be a positive association between highly educated and, and childcare because they have lots of resources to invest in their children. They have difficulty finding an equally good replacement. Um, but this can also be a normative change, the highly educated picking up norms um, in favor of intensive parenting, a, ge a general child-oriented culture or whatever. So I'm going to relate to a project of mine that is supported by one of the Swedish research councils, and we're happy to get this support. It's about time, gender parenthood, and time allocation in Sweden. And it encompasses issues on parenthood, how it impacts time allocation, if the couple situation impacts time use, the way people spend time together and whether that has been changing over decades, child gender and time use, if that is determining 
the amount of time and the activities of parents, and also whether women we whether we have a gender issue when it comes to overworked and underslept women, which is a highly featured um, phenomena in the popular press, not finding any support in, in uh, medical and time use evidence. So I'm going to give you a few results uh, from the, two fir uh, the, the first and the third um, uh, theme of the project, and uh, the third uh, theme is featured in the paper that I distributed. Everything's relating to Swedish time use survey data from 1990 to 2010. We have three waves. They're both, they're all executed similarly. Time diaries for one weekday and one weekday, time, 10 minute intervals. We look at primary uh, activities and who was present during the activity. We have a response rate that is falling dramatically, but Given the complexity of the time use survey, uh, this is not that bad because it's actually exactly on par or even a little bit better than the gender, general tendency of um, lower um, response rates in Swedish investigations. We apply different sample restrictions to different studies and approximately 7,000 individual diaries are uh, we are available per wave, and we have a good share of parents in each wave. We code time use activities, and we exploit the with whom indicators. So basically, I'm going to talk about paid work, routine housework, and child care, and the with whom. Was there any other person present when the activity was? We're mostly going to do uh, present OLS least squares, uh, models controlling for what's usually controlled for survey weights applied. All estimates shown are robust for model specifications with inclusion of employment status, income controls. So what you see is holding up for the fact that, that this is not dependent on their employment status or, or whether and their income. So it's not so much a choice uh, issue. So the impact of parenthood on men's and women's uh, time use. Did we reach the promised land in 2010? Well, this is a question that um, I've been eager to exploit because in a paper from 2009, Martin Dribe and I uh, found that in 1990, parenthood intensified a traditional gender division of labor, just as found in other countries, uh, just as considered uh, the major cause behind gender differences in time allocation, especially paid work and housework. Um, but um, in 2000, 2001, we found that it affected men's and women's time use in a much more similar way. So while men and women were not equal, it was not because of them having young children in the household. And this was, at least in Sweden, debunking a myth that men and women are equal. To in detail until they have children, then they become caveman and cavewoman, and that's what we're determined to be. So this is what <clears throat> the JMF paper featured. In 1991, um, having a child younger than four impacted, didn't impact men's paid work or routine housework compared to other men, controlling for a number of factors. Of course, these fathers do more childcare, and they have somewhat less leisure. But this is not really surprising. Looking at women, there is the expected decrease 
Women with young children do less um, paid work and routine housework. They do more child care. So we have a traditional situation, or a, what, what would be expected from theory. In 2010, 2000, we get these results. Having a young child impacts also men with fathers with young children doing less paid work and more routine housework than men with no young children. They do more childcare, have less individual leisure. Looking at the female uh, component, by interacting sex and age of youngest child, we find that there are even stronger impacts for women to do less paid work if a young child is present in household, but not doing more routine housework. Um, so what happened? A lot of people ask this, whether this was a temporary blip. The 1990s were difficult times in Sweden and the Nordic countries. We had a, a severe structural economic crisis uh, affecting not only employment, but also the welfare state. Lots of new things emerged during the 1990s. People said this must be a temporary phenomenon. So what we did was a, a, a colleague of mine and I did a study on the Nordic countries during the 1990s and looked at exactly the same question. We have a wonderful little laboratory of economic change in the Nordic countries in the 1990s, with Finland being more hit by the crisis than Sweden, Norway not being hit at all. What did we find? We found the same uh, development across time in all countries, not as strong as in Sweden, but the similar. Um, so what we found is that, that this must be a Scandinavian uh, phenomena. And we also tested it in a more international um, setting, looking at Germany, Italy, and Canada, um, and found that, yes, it's a Scandinavian phenomena, but that we have interesting change going on in other countries as well. So just recently, I updated the regressions, and this is what I find. Well, obviously, we're not in the promised land. Sweden is not the, the gender equal, gender neutral um, setting that, that we sometimes hear of. But we do have continuing shop, uh, change in line with gender convergence. Um, men's paid work, father's paid work, is somewhat negatively affected, but not statistically significant. There were actually no significant impacts of parenthood having young children. Routine housework, fathers are affected. They do significantly more, but there's no additional female component. The interesting thing that emerges is that actually we have more of maternal involvement um, in 2010, which could be indicative of, of, of uh, intensive parenting uh, coming to Sweden full scale. So as I said, follow-up studies um, has shown that this is not an altogether Swedish uh, phenomena. Uh, Scandinavian, supposedly related to welfare state uh, support to dual earner families, mediating work family com conflicts. What we see happening in countries with less support, belonging to the conservative and liberal welfare state regimes, exemplified by Germany and, and Canada, is that actually change is emerging with father's involvement in housework and especially childcare on weekends. 
So we don't see any distinction between weekends and weekdays in Sweden 1990 when the time you survey started. But this is because we, we probably were in a more advanced situation already then. But clearly, change is emerging with Canadian and German fathers taking on more domestic responsibilities during weekends, but not on weekdays. Unfortunately to say, nothing's happening in Italy, but um, we have to wait and see. So moving on to uh, the third uh, theme and the paper. This development, together with the power couples and the, 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 the quite surprising orientation towards family, despite Sweden being the country where we for decades heard about divorce, uh, women, emancipated women, uh, families that are taking different shapes and forms, um, and lots of other uh, sort of loose norms or we could say open-minded uh, perspectives, made us think about what goes on in these families. We have a setting <clears throat> where increasing work orientation among women uh, establishes dual households as norms. We have high levels of union instability, but also the work by Amato and others that say that spousal interaction is a key dimension of marital quality and satisfaction. We also know that time is scar a scarce resource and that in conflict with work and parenthood, these two are all often prioritized over time alone or time with your spouse. We also constantly hear about time pressures uh, having consequences for well-being, especially for parents. So this is an important thing to find out. What are people doing? Um, and this might be a predictor. How well families are doing time-wise may be a predictor on how well they will be functioning and how well our children will be functioning. We also have the literature of the second demographic transition. Lots of the things pointed out before are components of the second demographic transition. Delayed union formation. Yes, we, we, we have our first child in Sweden on average at age 30. Uh, structural below replacement fertility. Our last year's TFR was 1.9. Reduced family orientation remains to be seen. Rising individualism don't know. We also know that the child king parenting era is, was replaced by adult self-realization and individualization. But what about the intense parenting? So is Sweden a good case to study this for? I think so, because it's challenging the basic notions of the second demographic transition. We have late family formation, yes. We have high female employment, the dual earner norm since the 1970s. We have high divorce rates since 1974. It hasn't changed anything since then. Uh, we have actually high fertility. A two-child norm is very strong throughout the, the, the class distribution, the education, not much of, of an educational gradient, and if anything, higher fertility among the highly educated. And we have men's inroads into the private sphere after 1990. So what, we di what we're doing in this paper, and, and I just want to stress that any comment on the paper, uh, please knock on my door or send me a sharp email because we, we really want uh, input into this. So this is basically descriptives because they're easy to present. Um, what we find, so we divide, these are weekdays and we divide uh, the results, non-parents, parents. You should know that non-parents imply no child under 18 present. So they're not non-parents. They, they're older, um, typically, or younger. So they're, they're polarized. 
So what th these descriptives give us is that there is actually a general tendency for time together instead of time alone among couples, and they're cut at age 55, um, both without dependent children at home and those with children. Um, the decrease in time alone is statistically significant for women. Basically, they're becoming more similar to men, having had more alone time uh, in the beginning of the period. There are notable level differences in spousal time between couples with and without children at home, as expected. But this gap diminishes, but it persists, even if we combine time with only spouse and spouse present during family time, as you can see here. I'll get back to that. Um, so this is in line with the tendency towards togetherness. Spousal time is increasing for couples, uh, while it's decreasing for those with children at home, though only increase for men with children is significant. Among those with children at home, child time is increasing for men significantly, but not for women, where there's actually a very small decline, not significant which is another indication of gender convergence in time allocation, and with, uh, especially in time with children. So there are still significant level differences in the amount of time mothers and fathers spend with children only. So what we get from this is that kids are much more around their mother than their father. They see much more of what she does than what their father does. So also in line with the tendency towards togetherness, family time is increasing over time, and it's significant, increasing significantly irrespective of gender. Family matters because people may, it may be that people are choosing to spend time with family members over time with others, and time allocation that is actually diminishing. Also beyond the family sphere, there is a gender convergence with respect to paid work, not shown here, in that men, especially fathers, work significantly less over time, and women, especially mothers, work and commute significantly more over time. So we have a strong case for togetherness, and we have a strong case, I believe, for gender convergence over time. And just to give you a few illustrations, this is to, to show you the level differences. Uh, this is to combine the amount of time a, a, a coupled mother or father is spending with his, her spouse. Spouse only or at, in, in a family setting where everyone's uh, together. And here is the interaction men and women have with their children. One-on-one -on -one interaction in purple and as the family combined. So this is what we get. So this is for week ends, and I believe that it's important uh, to divide this because <clears throat> time allocations are very different um, on weekends. How am I doing time-wise? Hmm? Yeah, okay. So um, this is just to give you a, a flavor of this and I'm, I'm gonna give you some more results. So there is no general tendency for time together instead of time alone as for weekdays. Rather, there's no change for men and women with no children at home. The only uh, change actually is going on that women work more and commute more uh, on weekends. And this is relating to segregation actually with women being in, in, uh, in jobs that, that disproportionately have shift work on weekends, such as retail, but also care work, where you actually have to care for people uh, during weekends as well. 
There are notable differences um, when it comes to level of time in spousal time between couples and the, um, with and without children, just as in the previous case, uh, weekdays. Men and women with children reduce spousal time significantly over the decades, about half an hour. But nevertheless, they see more of each other because family time is increasing by an hour significantly. If we look closer at the results, this change is traded for time alone for women. But not for men, who instead of trade time alone in a big chunk, is trading minutes here and there in different um, time use settings. So what we end up with is that there is change, but less significant change over time compared to the weekday pattern. But um, um, this is probably because there are less restrictions and, and less norms adhering to how, how or, or less choice um, when it comes to weekends. So looking at the OLS multivariate results um, contr with controls, included, uh, rendering us pretty much the expected estimates throughout. And you can check in the paper if you, if you want to look more closely. I would say that the multivariate results confirm the descriptive patterns that I just laid out for you. What's notable is that they confirm the significant decrease in alone time for women they confirm the significant increase in line with gender convergence in child time through men becoming more involved, both one-on-one -on -one interaction, but also through the significant increase in family time, which is taking place across gender. OLS multivariate results net of controls confirm for weekends that women are trading alone time. Um, there is a significant decrease, but there's actually not much change when it comes to child time on weekends. But it also adds that there's not much significant change with respect to spousal time on weekends, but there is. In family time irrespective of gender. So what we have is an increasing togetherness traded in different ways according to gender towards a focus not only on children but also on family. We know that the number of and especially the age of children are strong determinants of, of all the time dimensions that we look at. Uh, <clears throat> we also know that education should be a strong determinant of time allocations relative to other factors. But we don't really find that. This is a comprehensive change that is taking place across with not very strong educational gradient. How should we understand this? So when we decompose what's happening along the different time dimensions. And now, now I'm focusing on weekdays because here it's the, the, it's the important arena and it's here where the action takes place. We find that this is mainly a behavioral change. So when we decompose and do the counterfactual um, analysis uh, proposed by Oaxaca and Blinder, we find that most change is m largely left unexplained. It's not explained by different characteristics of the populations under study. We would, I mean, when taking into consideration that this, the, this time use survey samples are becoming more educated, they're becoming different uh, along different lines, we are still left with large components. And what I've highlighted in red are more than 
left unexplained. But this is in time. How much with the, count with the counterfactual um, um, calculations? But, but it, they're indicating 60 or, or more percent left unexplained. So I think this is not because the population is different, um, but rather relating to something unexplained. And we could try norms. We could try reactions to the general um, Swedish uh, economic circumstances, et cetera, which we cannot really factor in, but, but I think this is uh, important. Um, so let me think. I thought I, I was going to wrap up. Yeah. Well, as I said, it can be norms. It relates to behavior, but I would say that it could also be the way people react to um, materialistic facts. I mean, the Swedish society, the Swedish economy has changed. Uh, it's not only about diffusion of norms, but rather uh, mores and people's lives are being directed in certain ways. I mean, we, we know, for example, that, that, that there's also been an, a, a significant increase in the uptake of public daycare, putting more than 85% than of all the preschoolers into public daycare, um, which is actually um, quite, I mean, a 20 percentage increase in the last 20 years. Uh, so something is happening, and maybe that's because people are, are more work-oriented in daytime, um, finding that, that children actually do pretty well in daycare, and leaving them with less time to perform family activities. Um, so, so it could be something more than just norms, but it's, it's not that they're, they're uh, socioeconomically different or SE, yeah. Um, so that's how I interpret it. I'm happy to get uh, uh, other. So, so I want to put this in, in perspective a bit. Um, so this, New Year, this Time Magazine feature talked about the fact that the working day of men and women across countries are actually pretty similar if you combine paid and unpaid work, and this is basically what we do in lots of classes, we have students calculate this and, and so, so on. So why, why worry? Leave it. But I would say we, we can't leave it by this because we know that women and men are not doing the same things. Men are better at picking up domestic duties in the sense of routine housework and child care. But compared to women, they do quite different things around the house and quite different things with their children. And as I said, since we have level differences remaining in the amount of time that men and women spend with their children, children are exposed to what their mothers and fathers are doing. Um, and actually, in a paper that I have going, um, I, I'm I look at mothers and fathers, I take into consideration child gender and control for the sibship composition, number of children, siblings, and gender composition. And what I'm finding is a quite surprising thing with quite strong gender uh, um, aspects of what parents do with their children. In very much in line with traditional female and male domains. Women with all else equal, women with daughters, do typically female stuff. They sew, they bake, they do different domestic things around the house, while women with boys do other things. Fathers also do, dif do different things, but less different 
but on the whole, they spend less time with daughters than with sons. So we have a case where we actually may have implications for the intergenerational transmission of gender roles, which is important. If we want to change uh, not only uh, time, you, time allocation patterns, but also uh, choices in, in education and labor market. And I would like to end with this, because I found this um, in a debate forum. And apparently, the, um, this is a girl who was in class write, uh, drawing this um, on the topic, when I grow up. Like, what do you want to become? When I grow up, I want to be like mommy. And this uh, instigated a, um, a viral debate in the US. Because what's mommy doing? Pardon? So. Yeah. So, so this is, so, so this was the reaction. So this was the reaction. Mom is pole dancing. But it's not. Because this is a woman working in a hardware store in Minnesota. And when there was a blizzard, she was the only one selling snow shovels. And all the men came to the store buying shovels. <laughs> so this is a young girl observing that her mother is doing something important, and she wants to become like her. We have a big challenge when it comes to conserving and gender, changing gendered behavior and choice, and spending time with our children is one of the, the things that may impact on this and actually may uh, fast forward or delay change. Not to mention that if uh, sensible people uh, are doing sensible things with their children, um, it will probably be good for, for child development um, as well. But that's for other people to uh, look into in further studies. So thanks for listening. <clears throat>